If you ask the average person today what the manned space program is, you'll hear things like the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. We see astronauts talking via satellite to high school students when performing experiments in space on long-term stays. Barring a tragedy, few of us paid attention to the shuttle launches. And once the investigations were finished, they were out of the news cycle again. Those of us with shiny adult hair remember another time, a time of Apollo. On a cold December night in 1972, I remember standing outside my home in Fort Lauderdale and watching Apollo 17 take our last manned mission to the moon. Three years earlier, we had gathered around the black and white television in the den to watch Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon from Apollo 11. And when I was in my medical residency, we would go to the theater to learn about the right stuff of the Mercury 7. But between the heroic Mercury astronauts, the moon landings, the shuttle disasters, and the high school lessons, somebody had to teach us how to live and work in space. The 10-man missions that taught us how to maneuver in orbit, to walk in space, to rendezvous and to dock. All the routine skills and the ability to live up to 8 to 10 days in orbit. Not only learning to do the task, but training the men that would later go on to land on the moon in Apollo and command the space shuttles. This series is about Project Gemini. We'll go over each of the missions, profile the crews, discuss what they did and what they learned. It seems as though history has forgotten them, but they are the ones that helped get us to the moon. And the triumph of the shuttle and the ISS was built upon the foundation they carefully laid in the mid-60s. So join me now as we review the two-man crews of Gemini, a bridge between Mercury and Apollo. While by no means roomy, the Gemini capsules were much larger than the Mercury capsules, and they carried two astronauts as crew. They were launched into orbit on a modified intercontinental ballistic missile, the Titan II. The capsule was approximately the size of the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle, and the two-man crew would sit next to each other for up to eight days, which was thought to be the round-trip time to the moon. Gemini 1 was a test launch on April 8, 1964. Carrying only instruments, it was designed to see if the spacecraft and rocket would survive the trip to orbit. While three orbits were planned, it lasted for 64. Holes had been drilled in its heat shield to make sure it did not survive the re-entry. Gemini 2 was launched in January of 1965. It was a suborbital flight designed to test the heat shield. It was picked up, refurbished, and reused, the first reused spacecraft until the shuttle program. This is the Manned Orbital Laboratory, a proposed military satellite used for reconnaissance purposes. Gemini 2 was reused uh, to test this system early on before it was canceled in the late 60s. The first manned mission of Project Gemini was Gemini 3. Launched on the 23rd of March 1965, the Gemini 3 capsule made three orbits of the Earth. Unlike the Mercury capsule, the Gemini capsules were designed to maneuver in space and change their orbit in preparation for future rendezvous. Following completion of the first orbit, the rockets were fired and the orbit was changed slightly. This was the first successful orbital change by a manned spacecraft. Gemini pilot astronaut John Young had a remarkable 42-year career with NASA. He flew six missions on four different types of spacecraft and is only one of three people that have been to the moon twice. The mission commander was Virgil Gus Grissom, one of the original Mercury astronauts. Gus Grissom was the second American in space aboard Liberty Bell 7 in Project Mercury. Liberty Bell 7 sank shortly after landing when the explosive bolts in the hatches prematurely detonated. It was Grissom that named Gemini 3 the Molly Brown in reference to the unsinkable Molly Brown of Titanic fame. An inquiry following the loss of the spacecraft cleared Grissom of any wrongdoing but resulted in the removal of the explosive bolts from the hatches. This would later have tragic consequences for Grissom. Gemini 3 was documented on film. Here's the original footage from the launch and the orbital insertion animation. Roger, understand. 
Ridge Week, the Ridge Week. Germany can fill out again. Tommy, if he wants to. One minute. Team on our last clear. There we go. Roger, loud and clear. Hawaii Capcom AFD voice check. Hawaii Ridge, loud and clear. We're green. Roger. RKV Capcom AFD voice check. AFD RKV Capcom Ridge, loud and clear. We are 45 Roger. seconds and counting. The range holding. Texas Capcom, Capcom AFD check. voice check. Texas Capcom Ridge, loud and clear. We are go. Roger. T minus 30 seconds. Quarters have gone to fast speed. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 0. Ignition.
few reports from the pilot. Roughly Pretty big pilot he got there, huh? Identifying the uh, 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 flight plan very carefully. Thank you, Major. Into the flight. Gordon Cooper just uh, just told Grissom that he's looking mighty good, and Gus gave him a very reassuring laugh. A very calm pilot in command of that spacecraft. Roger, Molly Brown, you go from here. Roger, Molly Brown, let's go. Roger. seconds into the mission, the uh, velocity of the spacecraft now approaching 12,000 miles an hour. The G-forces in the range of approximately 3.5 Gs. Steering right Flight down dynamic the line. Posture reports excellent okay. steering on this vehicle. We remain in the primary guidance phase okay. all the way. Bottom, All right, just stand by for my mark on point eight. We're getting a little bit of distortion mark on point eight. Reports, uh, Roger. But they're all very affirmative sorts of reports. I think it's in the communication system itself. We're at five minutes and 20 seconds in, and we're rapidly approaching the sustainer engine cutoff point. Looks good. We're 10 seconds from SECO, or sustainer engine set, second stage cut out. Right, there's Sean Goodwin there. Going to Bermuda. Standing by for confirmation of SECO. Roger, you Looking are going, Molly Brown. Guys. Has asked Gordon Cooper to tell Gus Griffin that he is good. And Molly Brown reports it's very happy about that go. Unlike the Mercury capsule, which was all inclusive, the Gemini had two parts to it. The black part is the spacecraft in the crew compartment. The white part behind it was an equipment bay that was discarded prior to re entry. Following the Gemini 3 mission, Gus Grissom remained with NASA. His next assignment was as commander of Apollo 1. He and astronauts Ed White and Roger Chafee died in a pre-flight test in January 1967. At the time, the Apollo 1 capsule was full of flammable material and pressurized with 100% oxygen. A short under Grissom's seat started a fire and it was over in 17 seconds. As a result of the accident investigation covering the loss of Liberty Bell 7, Gus Grissom's Mercury capsule, the Apollo capsules did not have explosive bolts on their hatches and rescuers could not get to the crew. Despite being reprimanded by NASA for smuggling a corned beef sandwich aboard Gemini 3, astronaut John Young enjoyed a 42-year career with NASA. He was the commander of Gemini 10, and the command module pilot for Apollo 10. He was the first human to fly solo around the moon. He later went on to command Apollo 16 and landed on the moon. Perhaps he is best known from that mission for jumping in the air while saluting the flag on the surface. Following the Apollo program, Young flew twice on the space shuttle Columbia and retired as director of astronaut operations in 2004. This is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you for stopping by and watching this video. Our next one's going to be on Gemini 4, which is the first American spacewalk. Looking forward to seeing you there. Please be sure to like and subscribe to my channel to see more of these videos.